Okay, uh, I don't know how much you engage the academic community uh, here, but if you've been watching over the last, I'd say, 36 months, there's been a mild uptick in essays by folks about, well, how do we improve the impact of political scientists uh, on policy? Uh, when I was at the APSA meeting two years ago, that was the number one topic. Now, kind of like some chronic disease, there's a cycle to this. It keeps coming back every about 10 or 15 years, and people wring their hands. You know, um, I said, well, you know, what is our relevance? So we're going through a cycle now. Um, I guess the good news of this presentation is there is a tremendous impact of the academic community on policy, but it's not in four weeks or four months or even four years. Roughly the impact of academic work is felt in policy in any substantial way in about 40 years. And what we're going to talk about is the bad news, and that is the impact of one uh, idea that was embraced by the academic or portion of the academic community about 40 years ago and it's the chickens are coming home to roost and that idea essentially is uh, more may be better now you know originally this idea was popularized I suspect uh, in any practical way by the French Pierre Galois comes to mind, there are other theorists. Uh, there's some, some work I've, that I've commissioned that details that period and the French thinkers that came up with the idea that perhaps having more nuclear weapons powers would, would make the world a safer place. But um, in any case, the academic community embraced this roughly, I'll give Ken Waltz the, the credit. I mean, you could probably assign it to someone else, but but he had a certain flair with a title, more may be better. Uh, and that was about 40 years ago. So uh, where we're uh, potentially headed, and what this brief spotlight is a possibility, is uh, you know, we talk about new, the second age, nuclear weapons age, second age. Well, we may be going into a new phase for nonproliferation. You know, up until now, you could argue that we, and when I say we, the U.S. and like-minded nations, uh, have thought that putting legal, diplomatic, and technical barriers in, in place uh, to head off countries from getting nuclear weapons was the way to go. Um, the new thought that we may be gravitating toward, and that I think this topic about the Middle East and starting with Saudi Arabia spotlights is uh, something a little different, which is, well, you know, uh, maybe if we let folks get right to the edge of getting nuclear weapons, kind of like conceal and carry weapons uh, laws back in my home state, the bars would get much quieter and, and things would be much safer. Uh, people would behave. Uh, there would be more peace as a function of fear and loathing. Yeah. So, uh, if I'm right about this, this development may be one of the more important developments, uh, not only of your lives, but of the lives of your teachers. And that would go back, you know, at least uh, until the late 40s in most cases, or a little later. That's a big swath of time, big event. So, uh, what I'm going to do is uh, announce what the uh, argument is. I call it the narrative. Does, does anybody understand what a political narrative is? Uh, has anybody read Plato's Republic? No? How'd you get here? What's that? No, it's just that <coughs> somebody has read it. Oh, yeah, there's nodding. Okay. Well, there's something in there where they talk about the cave analogy, and you're nodding. And essentially, um, it's, it's the same function of, uh, in finance, they call it credit, belief. 
that if you can get people to believe something, it becomes politically or financially true. Well, uh, narratives frequently uh, are more powerful than arguments or facts. They're stories. And even if they're wrong, people believe them. Off you go into the sunset with that narrative. And the challenge for sound politics is picking a narrative that draws people to the right conclusions that are good for them and the people around them rather than the wrong ones. Okay, so what is the narrative uh, for the Saudi deal, roughly? Um, well, first of all, Saudi Arabia needs nuclear power. They're running out of oil and gas. Um, nuclear power uh, will enable them to hedge against this downturn in fossil fuels. Um, we're all going to get rich helping them, uh, particularly America, because, well, we have the best technology. Anybody here from uh, Korea or France? Anyway, you're second rate. So uh, then the narrative goes something like this. Uh, the new crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman, is a great guy. He's our guy. He's a terrific guy. You're going to like him. We're going to like him. We should help him out. And then, if we, however, make things tough for him by insisting that he give up on reprocessing and enrichment, which he wants, oh, they're going to bolt. They're going to buy Russia. We're going to lose influence. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Okay. I think, to be fair and balanced, open-minded. Every one of those propositions is nonsense. What's interesting is how far that narrative has gone. I think it will carry this thing into signature, into force. But none of that makes any sense. I will try to show that to you, number one. Number two, um, I think we need to think about what happens if we go ahead with what I call a permissive deal, one that in various ways either lets them do enrichment or reprocessing right off, or my favorite is, well, after 10 years or whatever, I mean, a certain number of years that somehow you know, that time fuse makes you feel better about letting somebody do something that you don't really want them to do. Um, I think we need to know what those consequences are, and then sort of think about how much leverage, how much sense it would make to be kind of hard-headed about this. Uh, by the way, this is not the prevailing wisdom. Uh, I, I guess I'll be optimistic yet. But it's gaining. And we'll see something about that as well. So I don't want to be seen as someone pleading a case. Um, I'm always fond of reminding my students that in the end we're all losers. So I, I include myself in that. So this is not pleading a case so much as to shed light on things, okay? I want that to be understood by the start. Okay, well, why don't we get started? Okay, so let's do the order of battle this way. I mean, we could do it with a different arrangement. Also, uh, within limits, um, actually, I want to encourage you to interrupt. The limits are when you start doing a long speech. Um, I'll probably cut you off mercifully. But if you've got a question or a comment, I'd like it might be useful just to bring it up as we go along. Okay. Thank you for the legible screens. Oh, are these legible? Yes. Compar oh, you usually they're well it's I don't fun. like I don't like print, so I apologize even for this. I mean normally a, a PowerPoint should have an image that will work the mind, not a bunch of words. Anyway, that, this is just for me. I'm, I apologize that you have to see this. So we're going to ask the question, do they need nuclear power or to enrich or reprocess? Can we strike a formal nuclear cooperative agreement with Riyadh that fails to prove an enriching or recycling? 
without undermining non-proliferation regionally and globally? And doesn't the U.S. lack leverage to do anything since the Saudis can buy elsewhere? All right. Uh, one word answer to all these questions is no. So if you want a gentleman C and you need to rush off to the next class, we're done. <laughs> okay. Uh, that would be the, uh, I understand that the people at Yale have what they call the gentleman C. So that's for all of you. Uh, okay. First thing to observe with regard to running out of fossil fuels, um, you know, I suppose arguably we're running out of water and we're running out of oxygen while we're at it, and sunlight and moonlight, but at a very slow rate is my guess. And time, timing is everything in life. You know? The idea that they're running out is, is true in some sense that is not as interesting as what they're finding. And what they're finding is more than what they're running out of. Also, it isn't oil necessarily that's, that's so interesting. It's natural gas. And the reason why is natural gas is a terrific fuel uh, in some respects for making electricity. Essentially, those jet engines on the side of your airplane are what they use to make electricity. And that industry is extremely efficient. Uh, those, those engines are pretty impressive things. They get cheaper, lighter, more efficient, and net-net is, there's a reason why natural gas is burned now for electricity in the United States more than coal. And that's saying a lot, because coal needs to be king. Well, they're finding reserves uh, and and they have proven reserves that are quite interesting. To give you some idea, the United States has a lot of natural gas. What is roughly the population of the United States? Anybody know? 360 million. How much? 360 million. Yeah, that's very good. Well, I mean, that would be roughly 10 times, maybe nine times, uh, the population of Saudi Arabia. We have the same level of proven reserves. <laughs> Okay, heads up, that's interesting. We export. Tells you maybe they have a little right now, but if they don't have enough right now for what they want in the future, then you take a look at this map of what it is that they could tap into. And this is a map that does not include shale. This is conventional gas. Let's just say no, they're not running out of fuel for electricity. Not in any meaningful sense. Then there's this. It may well be that solar isn't exciting in Canada. Uh, although, I bet you they're working in Canada. But in Saudi Arabia, it's really quite a winner. Um, now, I did not understand this. I was always skeptical about this. Uh, a couple of things exploded my skepticism. Uh, first of all, I hired some people who actually knew a hell of a lot more than I know. And uh, this is a fellow, um, Robin Mills at uh, Quaymore Energy, who looked him up. But I had several other analysts with different perspectives, pro-fossil fuel, pro-renewables. They all said the same thing. Oh, you really want to get into this? I said, well, really? A couple of reasons. First of all, uh, there's a lot of sun there. This is well beyond anything that happens in Arizona, for example. The number of clouds are very few, ever. Okay, there, there's some wind. I, I'm not going to probably make a big case for that. But the sun, wow. Then there's this. The latest bid at the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, which was not the lowest bid, but the second to lowest bid, was about two cents and some odd and change for installed kilowatt hour for photovoltaic. The low bid right now is 1.7 cents. Can someone tell me what the installed uh, cost in, uh, per installed kilowatt hour, what the cost per installed kilowatt hour is for a nuclear power plant in? Uh, 
uh, let's say, the UAE. Does anybody know? It's not 1.7 cents. What do you think it is? No idea. Well, they're going to open up a department of economics here, aren't they? Energy economics. Who teaches energy economics here? No one, but there is one, somebody who's very interested in it. Well, I'm interested in it, and you are too. The answer is 11 cents. 1.7, 11. Gee, wow, that's a big difference. But then the hand goes up. Yes, but it's intermittent. Well, it is, but this isn't. We helped develop this. I think the Spanish have commercially perfected it. The UAE is building this, and so is the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. This is a big mirror reflector that heats up sodium, which stays hot after the sun goes down. It's a battery, and it makes electricity at night. Does anybody know what this costs for installed for one hour? Oh, less than eight cents. Hmm. Well, what's interesting, well, actually, it could be even less than that. Now, which one of these things is the point of any of them? You don't know either. Well, it doesn't matter. I'll just read it. This is an eye chart anyway. Um, they've got one project that's uh, less than five cents for installed kilowatt. Uh, some of these plants will be the size of like 700 or 800 megawatts of electrical. They're really big. So what is the takeaway between natural gas? Oh, did I mention you might want to connect your grid properly to other things? Uh, maybe you, you reduce the subsidies. What does natural gas and electricity cost in Saudi Arabia compared to this market, which is pretty low, it's pretty low market, a fraction. It's less. Well, why? They subsidize it. Well, why? Well, they want they want people to be happy. And they want them not to have to pay very much to live day to day. But as a result, as I once talked with an Iranian at, at one of these confabs in Switzerland, I said, "Do you really think you need nuclear power?" This was back in 2002. He said, "Of course not." He said, "But of course." The way we price it, we're going to run out of oil tomorrow. Uh, but if we change the price, we'd never need it. I mean, he was very candid about it. Same point here. If you change the subsidies, the demand for all of the electricity will go down. If you put all those things together, the UAE reached a, a profound conclusion, which most people don't know about. Um, they are not going to build any more nuclear power. And they do have more demand to meet, quite a lot. Now, if that's the case in the UAE, and it's because of these projects. In other words, when they decided to make nuclear power so many years ago, none of these numbers were this low. Something's changed. You would think the Saudis would be up on this. Now, I think they are, actually. They know all about solar. They've been on it. They're building it. Worth noting. Their conclusion is they need nuclear power, but their neighbors have concluded they're done. Uh, here is a uh, another comparative that was done not with Western numbers, but Middle Eastern numbers, with Middle Eastern analysts, not Western analysts, which you know, for those of you who are culturally sensitive should should make you feel better. You know? Not only that, but there is a way in which Western numbers and analysts skew things. Try not to do that here. This came out of uh, Dubai. And what you see here is nuclear is at the bottom near diesel turbines. Uh, it's not your best investment. And that's for Saudi Arabia. Okay. All right, but oh, we need to enrich. Well, what is the argument there? Well, we have 5% of the uranium in the world. And so we, we need to enrich, get it's sort of like uh, my wife is from Australia originally. There's a lot of there are a lot of sheep there. Well, so we, we need to make textiles and shirts. Um, they have a lot of uranium. Some of the people say, well, we got to do all sorts of things. Well, maybe, but <clears throat> what's the competition up to? Oh my God! Seems to be a lot of uranium. This is yellow cake spot price. 
it's not as low as it once was, but it's pretty darn low. It's around 22 bucks right now. Um, you, you'd want that number to be a lot <coughs> higher before you got a return on investment. Uh, oh, enrichment services. It's even worse. It is at a historic low. Why would you do this? This is like, um, how many of you have a car? Almost everyone. Almost everyone. Have you thought about getting an oil cracking plant and putting it in your backyard? <laughs> Probably not. You think, yeah, I'll go to the gas station. Same point. That's what they're proposing to do. So, I don't know, you know, when people say they're running out of oil and gas and, you know, they need nuclear power. That narrative, part of the narrative, just strikes me as phony. Very phony. Profoundly phony. Okay, now, everybody's entitled to do dumb things. But what is it uh, Dewey said? You know, my right to swing my fist ends at the point of your nose. I'm afraid if they go ahead, there's going to be, there's going to be some innocence uh, dragged into this. There's going to be some collateral damage. We don't talk enough about this, although that part of the narrative has changed. By the way, the first part of the narrative, it's beginning to change on Capitol Hill. Little eyes are opening up, lights are going on. We go, oh, you know, maybe they don't need it. Same thing on this. You'll hear this uh, noted uh, frequently enough, at least on the Hill, which is um, in a never-ending effort to uh, seal the deal, uh, our State Department always has, uh, well, increasingly is doing two things. Making sure that the agreement automatically renews so they don't have to go back to Congress for fear that <laughs> Congress might say no. Uh, the other thing that was uh, put in, and I did not know this until recently, is this last bit of language, which is, uh, if at any time, uh, oh, see, see, oh, here we go, um, U.S. confirms, you know, we're doing this cooperation, uh, but this cooperation shall be no less favorable in scope and effect than those which may be accorded from time to time to any other, well, neighbor, essentially, in the Middle East. If uh, that's not the case, then UAE uh, will ask for the full details of the improved terms and um, will consult with the, the government uh, regarding the possibility of ending this agreement. That's code for, hey, you should presume that we go for something more generous with one of our neighbors, we get the same treatment. Now, legally, you could read this and say, well, it doesn't say you have to. Uh, and that's true. But in politics, expectations drive law. You've raised them here. You don't deliver. There's going to be some pound of flesh to pay for this, politically. Now, if it was just them, that ought to be darn interesting on its own terms. It's in the Egyptian agreement as well. I didn't realize that. I didn't, it, reading really is quite an amazing form of spy espionage activity. It's, it's almost seditious because nobody does it. But if you do it, you discover that, oh my God, we've been doing this before. Now, in addition, the agreement with Egypt expires in 2021. Morocco and uh, that's not correct. It's hard to get in good health. That, I think I typed that. I think that should be 2020. I'm going to say it's 2021. I know Turkey is 2023. And Jordan, well, of course, we want to have Jordan uh, on board. So one of the fun things is if you strike a deal, with Saudi Arabia, it becomes a template or model for all these countries. Um, then my favorite, uh, Israel. People forget it, but Israel was uh, very keen in supporting the India deal when it came out. And part of the reason why is they submitted a white paper uh, to the NSG saying, aren't we next? And the rejoinder was, well, we'll get back to you. Uh, that's to say, silence. However, uh, I can tell you that I was approached by someone fairly senior on the staff of one of the major committees on the Hill 
saying, well, if the Saudi thing goes ahead and all hell breaks loose, we have to up the ante and help Israel out. And I'm sure if we passed a senselessness of the Congress resolution saying they should get an India deal, everyone would vote for it. What do you think? What do you think? Um, I said, well, first, unfortunately, I think you're right. It would pass. <laughs> uh, and I say, unfortunately, because um, I think if that happened, um, several things could occur that would make the Arab programs, which, you know, in all honesty, might not be all that serious, get very serious. And he said, why and how? I said, well, why would Israel want to get an India deal? Oh, so that they, you know, have higher status and prestige. And I said, well, okay, but is there any technical reason? I said, do they need a nuclear power plant to produce electricity? And the answer was, well, no. Well, because they have all this natural gas, if you haven't looked. There's enormous fines. Same with Egypt, by the way. Uh, I said, so can I help you here and explain it? I said, how old is Demona? Well, it's, well, it's uh, 55 years old. Now, they've upgraded it. What does it make that matters? He said, oh, plutonium. I said, well, maybe. But what's the thing that they definitely need, even more than plutonium? He didn't know. I said, it was tritium. I said, well, what is it that you can make in a civilian reactor that a safeguarded reactor doesn't monitor or care about if you put aside? And he said, really? I said, yeah, it's tritium. I said, once that gets out, and it's not a classified point, it's going to outrage a lot of people, including a lot of Arabs. And I think you're going to inherit a whirlwind. Now, I don't know that the Israelis want to do this. I would advise them against it. But all of this is in potentia in play. This one doesn't end well. Then uh, you have this. Uh, whether you're for nixing or fixing, uh, it's going to be an interesting counterpart if you reach an agreement before you nix or fix. I would think that the order of battle would be nixing or fixing and then seeing what you've got, and that ought to be controlling in the terms of what you do for this deal. Newsflash, they have a text. The Saudis have a text. So apparently we didn't wait. I think that's pretty wild. You'd want to know what the fallout and knock-on effects of doing one or the other of these things would be. That won't happen probably until May or June, if then. And yet we've already laid down terms of agreement. Now, thankfully for the moment, the Saudis are not saying yes, sir, and signing. But how that plays out is kind of interesting. Um, oh, I didn't, you know what's not, you know what's missing? Ah, you know, well, there was a beautiful picture, imagine this, of a submarine, and it was South Korean. Why would I bring a picture like that into the, into the, the brief? Well, one of the key <coughs> contractors, as we'll find momentarily, is uh, the South Koreans. They have a leg up, I think, on possibly building something there. One of two reactors. See, there's something called the small modular. Uh, what does the A stand for? Uh, it's, a, it's a small modular reactor. It's an old combustion engineering design, about 100 megawatts electrical. We'll see a picture for it. Uh, or this large machine they have called the APR 1400, 1400 megawatts. They have a leg up. They are already holding events in Washington with analysts saying, well, we should understand that a permissive deal isn't as bad as it looks. Or as the, or as the Israelis would point out, no, it's not as bad as it looks. It's much worse. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but for them, it doesn't look so bad. Why? Well, what of the, uh, even President Moon, does anybody know what he wants in the way of uh, nuclear propulsion? Well, he wants a nuclear submarine. Well, you do know about it. Uh, I've read. You've read about it. Yeah. By the way, you all need to follow my Twitter feed. <laughs> you will be so brilliant. They won't know what to do with you. Well, they'll make you, you teach part-time here. <laughs> I think I'm kidding. Anyway, uh, 
Right. And you know, you're not, okay? <laughs> you heard it right from there. You're not. <laughs> okay, so uh, he says he wants a nuclear submarine. Well, what do you need for a nuclear submarine, channel? Enriched uranium. I've, I've never heard of any, any uh, well, maybe the Russians have plutonium. No, it's always yeah. enriched uranium. All right, well, there you have it. Could it be that if we cut a deal that allows Saudi Arabia to enrich uranium, Mr. Moon or his successor might come to us and say, come on, we're, we're a security ally. Where's ours? So the knock-on effects of this are pretty big. Uh, I always like putting this up. Um, and this is, you know, he is our new Shah of Saudi Arabia. That did not work out so well. We are dealing with the fallout from leaning very heavily on this fellow now. So many decades later, how will this work? We don't know. Okay, uh, but why are we willing to take this risk? Ah, the new math. This is the point I, I opened up with. What's going on is basically no one's saying this. Well, a few people are saying it, pundits are saying it. But behind the scenes, you've got to imagine uh, this thought is in the background, if not explicitly in the foreground, and that is, well, uh, nonproliferation is kind of a joke. Uh, the NPT is kind of a joke. Uh, the IEA is kind of a joke. So we got to get serious. And the way you get serious is you say, well, instead of relying on those things or wagging our finger, what we'll do is we'll push the needle 180 degrees in the other direction. And what we'll say is, if you let, if, if Iran gets a weapons option, which it sort of has, uh, and gets a bomb or gets a bomb, it, what we do is we have enhanced deterrence by having our neighbor, who we like, get an, get an option or a bomb as well. And then if, if you have one weapons option and one bomb that's Iranian, and you have one weapons option or bomb that's Saudi Arabian, you add them together, you get zero. They neutralize. You didn't know that. It's called deterrence. Yeah. All right, we're big on deterrence. I bet you there's a course somewhere where they talk about that. Deterrence. It's, it's a magical thing. All right. See, now, it could be, though, that old math would tell you that those are two. You put one plus one, it's two. But in the Middle East, maybe the way to look at it is one plus one is more than two. Or maybe it's not even the Middle East, it's in the world. This math is being debated sub salento without being discussed explicitly enough in my book. But this, this is what's driving this. And the reason I say that, oh, here it is. Oh, neato, okay. Uh, all right, at least you can see the submarine. Uh, that's a conventional one, but you know, they're ready to make it propelled with something else. All right, then the argument is, well, okay, but you know, we're, we're giving up on a chance to make lots of money and leverage. That is the percentage uh, of shares owned uh, by folks who are not American. Uh, for Westinghouse. That's 100%. Okay? That's the American firm that we're counting on to make us rich. They do not manufacture anything. They put nameplates on licensable items such as coolant pumps made by Curtis Wright. But those pumps uh, Actually, you can substitute other pump manufacturers for Curtis Wright, uh, and, and we'll get to that in a moment. That is our money-making ace in the hole. Now, the rest of the money is made for things that are not uh, licensed. It's like conversations, design work. Uh, I talked last night at a wedding with a young lady who worked for a law firm that was billing, uh, I think, $800 an hour to tell them uh, how to think about nuclear regulation. I mean, so there's lots of money, but none of that is controlled by a one, two, three agreement. And people conflate these things. Oh, it's worth billions. How much of it <coughs> requires a one, two, three is what you're going to ask for. And the answer is very little. Then they say, oh, but they'll buy Chinese. Well, I don't know. Uh, maybe eventually. But right now, 
the only reactors for export that matter uh, is one that's not been built, the uh, Chinese AP-1400. Uh, and the reason it hasn't been built is they haven't even brought on its, uh, its predecessor on the line, which is the Westinghouse AP-1000. That's based on the same design. They're not going to probably be pushing that until we get some performance data, uh, operational experience from what its predecessor is. The Hulong One, meanwhile, is being looked at by the British. Uh, they may certify its suitability for operation in 2022. Why would you? Well, you know, maybe you feel lucky. Okay. Here's the favorite argument: they'll buy Russia. Well, maybe. They've got a product. They certainly built it. Of course, it jumped off the grid in the first safety test in late 2016. But, you know, maybe you feel really comfortable with that. Um, in addition, there is this problem that when you let Russians in, there's mischief. You know, uh, the Turks are having a little bit of a time trying to figure out where the rest of the finance is going to come from, because they alienated the private financiers, 49% of the project. South Africans uh, let the, the Russians in, and now they have a new president because of the corruption. Now, I don't know that that would be the case, and I don't think any of that's particularly a compelling argument. But I'll tell you one that I think is very compelling, and I managed to convince others of it. Uh, I'm not sure I'm right, but it sounds like I'm right. If you want to develop a bomb option, and oh, by the way, the Crown Prince pretty much said, if Iran gets it on 60 minutes, we got to get it as soon as possible. Why would you, you buy from the vendor that's helping your arch adversary in the nuclear field? Is it because you want them to spy on you and make sure that the Iranians know exactly what you're doing? Or are you just dumb? I don't think the Saudis are stupid people, okay? That's another thing that people sort of say, oh, they can't do anything. How many times have we heard that one? Oh, North Korea, they can't do anything. Pakistan, is that too stupid? I don't think that's the way the world works. I think they're pretty smart people. Now, this is a leading candidate because it's being built in the UAE. That slipped a little. Uh, they found they didn't have the people to operate or regulate the darn thing. Um, so it's probably opening late eight this year, maybe but more likely uh, sometime next year. But it's roughly on schedule, roughly on budget. Uh, it got certified and is operating in Korea, and it's you know it's got a safety record. And there's a construction crew, and they're right there in downtown Saudi Arabian Peninsula. All I got to do is I don't know, fly them in or bus them in from across the border. They're ready to go. Uh, or even that. The other thing that's gotten zero attention is this thing. This is a small reactor. A small reactor, get this, is 100 megawatt electric. Does anybody know what the first nuclear weapons production reactors, what electrical ratings roughly they were in? I don't know. It's France, Israel, North Korea. In India. About 10 megawatts. 10, maybe the most, 30 at the most. 100? That's big. <clears throat> big enough to justify either an overt enrichment program, or if you want to use it as a cover to buy kibbles and bits to assemble your own enrichment program, it might produce enough noise you'd never get the intelligence signal of what the hell is going on. This thing, they claim, might be built in four years. I don't believe it. But it probably would get built for less, sooner, and not need as many people. This does not require 123. It's all Korean indigenous. At least they argue that. And I think we have not said otherwise yet. Uh, OK. Now, to head this one off, but it could be that because we're not going to sell American, we need to have the gold standard. <laughs> There's something a little different. Does everyone know what the gold standard is? Maybe I need to explain that. Uh, how, a show of hands of those that think they know what it is. Okay. 
Uh, why don't you explain what you think it is? So, I figure how to word this. Gold standard, I guess it pertains to whether or not countries with uh, nuclear programs, to what extent they're allowed to enrich. Okay, that's roughly it, but let's, let's put some uh, clothing on the man. In 2009, we reached an agreement with the United Arab Emirates, and we said, you can, you can have nuclear cooperation with us, and we will make sure that key American nuclear parts on our regulatory list go to the Korean machine, but only if you, for legally and in a binding way, forswear enriching, reprocessing, manufacture of heavy water, heavy water reactors, and you sign up to the additional protocol. And that's the gold standard. It was referred to as the gold standard for nuclear cooperation, uh, non-proliferation condition. Uh, we are not necessarily, it appears, are going to insist on this with this agreement uh, with the Saudis. But perhaps we should encourage the Koreans to do so particularly if they're not even going to buy American. Or maybe we should insist on the agreement even if it, we don't sell anything American, so that it covers everything. Because the standard 123, or nuclear cooperative agreement, that the U.S. has, the boilerplate, only covers American-related equipment and material that coming out of it or into it. It doesn't cover everything in the, in the kingdom. Gold standard, understanding would. <coughs> Now, of course, the argument is, oh, well, we don't have leverage because they're going to buy Russian. Of course, I don't think they're going to buy Russian. But uh, I, I don't know Senator Reid or his staff, but I'm trying to find out uh, who works this there. Because he, he, he said in one sentence something that just struck me as profoundly correct. For this, I'm sure he'll be penalized or ignored. I, I don't know. But he, <laughs> stunning. He said, I think the proliferation dangers of cutting a deal without an enrichment or reprocessing ban are so great we should be able to wield all the influence we have, which goes way beyond this one nuclear-related transaction, to insist upon the same standards that we apply to the Emirates. I was asked at a hearing, you know, I testified on this, and you get the benefit of somebody who just testified. One of the Congress uh, people, uh, and you can get that, uh, you, you should watch the whole hearing. It's really interesting, and not just because I'm brilliant, but because everybody else is pretty smart, too. It looks like, you know, for two hours, the experiment of self-government was working. I mean, people asked questions, and they said, oh, yeah, they changed their minds. Really quite interesting. It's enough to make you want to stay and complete your degree here, right? Okay. So, one of the questions was, well, I don't get it. If the NPT is already signed, why do we need the gold standard? And then, of course, a related question is, well, do we really have any leverage to prevent them since they can buy? And I said, you know, um, brings to mind the comment of Mr. Stalin about the number of uh, divisions the Pope had. By the way, he doesn't have any. The NPT doesn't have any divisions either. The U.S. military, however, we do have divisions. And we occasionally come to the rescue of countries like Saudi Arabia. Like we've already done it recently, once, big time. Why do you think they're buying all this American hardware? It isn't just because they like to buy American, it's like a brand name or something. It's because it locks us in. We don't have leverage. You've got to be kidding. And the, and the senator understood it. And I didn't even talk to him. Because how I, I like to say, medium-sized minds think alike. Yeah. I gotta believe we also have leverage over Korea. And what would be amazing is if we didn't use it. Uh, that's the end of it. But I tell you what, what is what would be amazing is maybe what's going to happen. Now, uh, there is uh, some legislation uh, that's that's kind of interesting and related to this that was brought up at that hearing. It's, uh, you can look it up. It's called House Resolution 5357. 5357. Uh, by the way, if you are interested, you are entitled because you haven't quite left yet, but you're racing out the door. I'm talking to you. Hello. <laughs> Would you like a free book? 
yes. I'll well, the, well, thank you. Sorry, I have a class. <laughs> yes, here you go. I'm just trying to help you here. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Appreciate it. You don't let anybody slip out like that. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to interrupt you. That's all right. I'm just kidding. Go ahead. So, uh, you may see more people living with the classes. Oh, well, that's all right. By the way, before you leave, you're right here. Um, the, the legislation says that instead of having, yes, there you can just I'll distribute just them. Yeah. yeah, just take some at the end. Okay. Actually, here, move these down as well. So, the legislation says if the gold standard isn't included in an agreement with a country that isn't recognized to be a weapon state under the NPT, Congress needs to vote a joint resolution of approval for the agreement before it goes into, into force. And they post-dated it so it would include the Saudi deal. Now, a lot of people say, well, wait a minute. The Republicans are in power. That won't pass. Well, it might not, but it might get out of committee. And it might because the sponsor is a Republican. It's Ross Lehman. They already have several co-sponsors, I think six, roughly, something like that. More important, as I pointed out to a Democrat who was saying, well, this is hopeless, well, because the Republicans are in control, I said, did it ever occur to you that we still have elections? <laughs> that might change. It might change pretty soon. And if it does, you'll be in control of this. And he said, God, I, I forgot about that. Watch this spot. I don't know that the legislation will succeed, but I don't know. And I don't think the administration knows. And I think increasingly they're going to be looking at this and wondering what they should do. The last time Congress threw a fit about an agreement before it went final, it was renegotiated twice. That agreement was the UAE agreement. It produced the gold standard. So, 